our gracious God and our Father, we thank thee for the theme of the solar just sound. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Oh, we thank thee one day he's going to cleave the heavens. And he's going to burst into view. And oh God, we thank thee that in the second stage of his advent we're going to be admired with him. And he'll be admired in us with all that believe as we come back to reign on this earth. And oh, we're looking, we're anticipating, blessed Lord, for that day when the heavens will open. And oh, that, that, that there'll be the trump, there'll be the sound of the archangel, and the voice of God. And we'll be caught up right through clouds and clouds of believers from every part of the earth. Clouds caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And then we're going to go right through the open heavens. And we'll be transfigured and transformed and be like a Redeemer forevermore. Fully sanctified. Glory, hallelujah. Oh God, thou, we thank thee that the captain of our salvation is is bringing his son safe home to glory. Prepare us for the glory land right now at this convention, this moment. Now, Holy Spirit of God, will you give me the message? Take me from verse to verse or incident to incident. And let there be nothing of man. Oh, Father, we're, too, we're so tired of man. Let there be nothing of man. Lord, even respectable man. Let nothing be or of man in this service right now. Holy Spirit of God, will you speak? It's thy divine prerogative, it's thy ministry. You came on the day of Pentecost to inhabit thy church, to speak through thy church and to speak to thy church and to make known the glories and the wonders of the living God and the wonders and the beauties of the Son of God. Oh, do this work this morning, we beseech of thee, for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, I would like you to keep in touch uh, with God in prayer for the little while we are together this morning as I speak on the ministry uh, of revival. Now, many friends have asked us about different books on revival. And the best book I have in Revival, I'm sorry, is not with me because it's published in Great Britain by Marshall, Morgan, and Scott, and it's entitled Open Windows. Uh, I, I haven't uh, got any with me, but I may be able to secure some copies. And uh, the, the message of Open Windows, it's the bestseller just now in Sweden, in a Swedish translation. And Open Windows is... God opened the heavens and coming down and giving us revival. But I have two books just now, one dynamite in Europe, and there are two photographs there of the two mightiest revivals I have known in Europe, apart from Reverend W.P. Nicholson of Ulster, whom I mentioned to you last night, a Presbyterian revivalist. You have a, a precious photograph of a man of God there, a Russian Baptist pastor who was used by God to start 200 new Baptist churches in his lifetime. And he was the founder of the First Baptist Church in Moscow. And I labor with him in revivals among the Russian people. And then the eldest daughter of General William and Catherine Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. She lived in the atmosphere of revival. And this tells you a little uh, by one of our leading British authoresses, the story of part of our revival ministry in Europe. Of course, she couldn't tell all because she only traveled with Mrs. Jure and I for about seven months, but she let you in to revival meetings. And then we just finished this, printed last week, an exposition of Acts 1 and 2 about what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that really whets your appetite for revival. Because we believe that Pentecost can be repeated and it may not have all the same signs as we had on the day of Pentecost, but we believe, friend, that Pentecost can be repeated. Calvary was once and for all for this age and Pentecost was once and for all for this age. And we are now living under the in the dispensation of God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has never been withdrawn from the church of Jesus Christ. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. Then why is he a stranger among us? Why is he not performing his many mighty works? 
Now, it's the devil's business in these last days to send us counterfeit. Now, even in the Welsh Revival, which began so pure from the throne of God, we discovered later, Satan says, Now, I cannot destroy that revival, but I will try and imitate the revival. And the Antichrist, you see, actually that word anti, as you know, doesn't just mean against, but also means like. And we are told by Timothy that in the last days, just as these, these emissaries of Satan, they try to imitate everything that Moses did, so the devil in the last days will try to imitate everything that the Holy Ghost is doing, you say. And so you have counterfeit conversions. That's the devil's master stroke in evangelism. They are, they are millions of deluded souls in America who believe they are going to heaven and all the time they're going to hell. And there are also tens of thousands of Southern Baptist churches who have a counterfeit conversion. They have never been truly supernaturally born again of the Holy Ghost. And the pastors and the evangelists have to blame because they do not demand a supernatural change. If regeneration is a supernatural work of God the Holy Ghost, then it's a supernatural new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm a Scotsman. I don't try to be a Scotsman. I am a Scotsman. Everything I do has a Scottish aspect. That's my family. And you don't try to be a Christian. You don't imitate to be a Christian. You are a Christian. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And when you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away and all things have become new. You are counterfeit. You have counterfeit what I call a sanctification. A, a person says, I'm clean every whit, I'm fully sanctified. And you just touch them the wrong place, rub them up the wrong way, and you'll find they've got a vicious bad temper. And then you have counterfeit consecration. Over and over again, we have people who come forward every Sunday morning say, I am fully yielded, I will follow thee, Lord Jesus. And on Monday morning, they live out the lie once again. And you can have counterfeit fullnesses of the Holy Ghost. And that's where the devil wants to send the counterfeit. People say, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. And you, uh, they t you can tell by their life that they're not full of the Holy Ghost. And then Satan says, I'll send a counterfeit revival. Now you can have all the crowds. And you can have all the emotions. Something like a revival, but not a revival. And I have known... In, in large meetings in America, when the Holy Ghost was nowhere near the tabernacle, uh, that uh, many, many people surged forward in the front to be saved, surged forward in the front to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and yet the Holy Ghost was nowhere near. It was all something spurious, something counterfeit. Uh, and so the devil is going to try to hinder us having the real thing. But my brother, this morning, uh, I have a message to speak to you on open windows. Now, I have never spoken on this before. Just as I was walking up and down here a, a few minutes ago, this is the, the line that God has led me to speak on. And it's on the theme on revival. Now, I want just to speak, uh, as the Spirit gives me utterance on, living under an open heaven. Living under an open heaven. Now, as we know, there was only one person who lived under an open heaven continually, and that was our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that the heavens were opened at his birth. For unto us a son is given, and unto us a child is born. As the son, he was from all eternity, and as the, the child, he was born miraculously in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And so the heavens were opened at his birth, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus, the heavens were opened, and Jesus Christ came down to this sin cursed world. And right through his life he had that open window. Three times over the heavens were opened, declaring, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The heavens were opened to remember in his baptism, and the Holy Ghost descended upon him as a heavenly dove. And he received a mighty supernatural anointing for his ministry, as prophet and priest and king. And the only time when he did not have an open window was when he was bearing your sin and my sin on the cross of Calvary. And there he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But blessed be God, friend, he had an open heaven when the heavens were open to receive him. 
as we read in Psalm 24, who is this King of glory? Oh, let the King of glory come in. And all the heavens too, all angels of heaven, all seraphims and cherubims too, to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ home to glory. I thank God he lived under an open, uh, the open sky. Now, many believers have lived under an open sky almost every day of their life. I remember hearing F.B. E. Meyer when he was a, a very elderly gentleman, had to be propped up with two nurses looking at the other side of him as he spoke from a chair over the pulpit. No loudspeakers these days. And he said, so far as I know, there has never been a day in my life that I have had not open access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, he was a humble old gentleman. Now, that does not mean to say that what he said was absolutely true. Uh, I can remember my mother coming to me saying, and my mother's very quiet and conservative, and saying to me when I was first converted, James has said, I think I have lived without sin for the last six months. Well, I was so horrified. Living without sin for the past six months. That my dear mother has walked with God from the a girl of 13 years of age to, to now 88 years of age. And if you would go into what's supposed to be a death room, you would find the heavens were open. The heavens are open. And, and my mother's lived almost her entire life under an open sky. And you will find that holy men and women of God right through the Old Testament, they lived under an open sky. Now there were times when they were in darkness. Now don't get discouraged. There were, for exa example, Ezekiel. Uh, he saw visions of God. The heavens are open. He saw visions of God. And he saw God's prophetical truth for hundreds of years to come. Uh, but the, Ezekiel also saw the Shekinah glory of the Lord gradually withdrawing itself from the temple. I think of the mighty Elijah, but he got in a cave. And the, there's many a preacher in a cave today. Preacher, have you come and are you in the cave? You're, you're not out in God's fresh air, and you're not looking up into an open heaven. And you haven't got the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost upon you. And Jesus Christ is not so real, and Jesus Christ is not so precious as he used to be to you. But I think of dear Moses, and he, he had the visions of God, and he was caught up into the most excellent glory. And there Moses, under an open heaven, he had the whole pattern of the tabernacle brought before him. Glory to God. Every, every bit of wood, every minutest detail was given to him by revelation from God himself. And so he was left in no shadow of doubt how that tabernacle had to be built. Because that tabernacle, every bit of it, had to speak of the glory, of the duty, of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I trust that some of you dear brothers and sisters will be caught up into the heavens this, these days. And that you will receive God's divine pattern for your life these coming days. There's a crisis just now. And you've come here to meet with God. And you've come to have a revelation from God. And God is saying to you, my brother, my sister, Behold, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. I will bring the blind by a way that the new not. And I'm going to lead you in strange ways, paths that you've never trod before. And I want you to put your hand in my hand, and through the darkness we'll go together until we come out into the sunlight. Maybe you're crying like Saul of Tarsus at his conversion. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what is thy plan for my life, my, thy immediate plan now for my life? What is thy pattern for my Christian worship and my Christian service? But I can conceive just this morning about the open windows in relation to revival. Now, you know that revival is nothing, nothing else than the, the windows of heaven open, you say. And you needn't die to go to heaven. You have heaven here below. And when unconverted people and the demons in hell try to shake your faith and say, there's no such a place in heaven, there's no such a place as hell. When you die, you die like a dog and that's the end of you. You can laugh and mock and you can say, go to God, I've been in heaven for the past few months. Amen. And you see, when revival comes, it, it, it comes because the heavens are open. And you see visions of God and you can see right through the door. 
right through the window and you can see right into heaven. And you are also caught up into heaven. As I mentioned to you in the story there of Evan Roberts, when the Spirit came, he was caught up every night for several months in his little bedroom there in Wales, caught up into heaven, communing with the Lord Jesus Christ before the revival came. And so, uh, when, the, when the meeting started, he was a man who was a heavenly man. He was already transfigured and transformed like Jesus Christ. And he was so like the Lord Jesus that many people were astonished and thought Jesus Christ was incarnate again. He was such a holy man, just a young man of 24 years of age. In and out of the meetings like this, if Jesus Christ again was walking, walking here on earth. And the heavens are open. And in revival meetings, the heavens are open. And the people see right up into heaven. They're there already. They hear the singing. And they join the singing of the redeemed already. Oh yes, they join the singing of redeemed. Now, and that is why that when you're in such an atmosphere, you get dazed at the glory of God. And I have known whole congregations absolutely dazed. You remember we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 how that Moses, he took the veil off his face when he went into the presence of God, but he had to put the veil on his face when he was talking face to face with the children of Israel. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you have the contrast between the glory of the law in the face of Moses and the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul says, if that ministry of the Old Covenant was glorious, how much more is the ministry of the New Covenant? In other words, of Moses' face shone. Oh, brother, sister, should our faces not shine even greater? And I have known the brothers come out of revival meeting and gone home. And the bus people, the bus conductor, to the shock of his life when he's asking for the faith. And I have known believers drive home. And when they, they, they couldn't drive home, they had to just stop the car and say, Oh God, will you, will you withhold thy hand? And I've known believers go into their own home and their, their wife has said, What's wrong with you? Where have you been? And she's, she's woke, just, she's been a backslide. She broke down weeping, got, came back to the Lord. She saw the glory of God in the face of her husband. Now, this is the open windows. And that is why they pass, the meetings pass as if they're just a few minutes. You're there five hours. And then somebody says, five hours? Impossible. I think I've only been here five minutes. You know why? Because, you see, eternity is timeless. There's no calendars. Brother Lee can go on with his calendar in the pool if he wants. You see? There, there, there's no time in eternity. No time in heaven. There's no clocks in, in heaven, you see. Why? Because the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's enough. And when you're in his presence, the, the hours pass like minutes. And you simply can't believe. It's another impossible to believe that you've been in God's presence all these hours. I like our meetings recently in Northern Ireland. Believers would come and shake their heads and say, impossible. Impossible. What? We've been here five hours? It's impossible. It's just been like five minutes. And a man or woman who would come into a meeting and growl and grump because the sermon was five minutes over the 12 o'clock hour. He, he, he said, I, I just can't go home. I, I just can't go home. And wife, I'm not going home. You can go, but I'm not going. I'm just staying. And you see, and so many times in Eastern Europe, in our Baptist churches, we don't go home on Sunday. Who wants to have a, who wants to have a fried chicken if you can have a glory to God if you can have a feast with Jesus? Oh, no. Oh, no. When I first came to the States, I got the shock of my life. I was, had just finished revivals in Europe, you know, in Poland. And uh, when I came to preach in this great Baptist church, the, the pastor said to me, he said, Now, Dr. Stewart, he said, you know, please remember it's only a 20-minute message you have this morning. I said, 20 minutes? I said, is this a church or what? What is it? I said, but do you have meetings every night? No, he said, we don't. And in fact, he says, the majority of Christians only come on Sunday morning. And I said, you only have 20 minutes for them? I said, is that all you can preach? No, no, he says, that's all they will listen. He said, you see, the, the, all the restaurants will fill up and they'll not be able to go and have the Sunday dinner. They'll not hurry up and get into these restaurants they're all filled up. I said, my brother, I said, don't you dare affront God. Don't you dare himself the Holy Ghost ask me to preach 20 minutes to please Jesus. I won't do it. I won't do it. I said, you can encourage them all right. I said, brother, I said, you're going to damn this soul. 
I said, did you get no evidence of being born again? There were a person is thinking of that dear old Sunday dinner more than the, uh, the, the Bible study you're given them. There's something wrong with the regeneration. There's something wrong. And I said, they, they may all know all the language of Canaan and sing all the hymns, but I said, they may make as loud a profession as they can, but it's hard for me to believe they're really born again. Hard for me to believe they're born again. But my dear friend, when revival comes, the heavens are open. And these people will sit spellbound for hours and hours. Amen. And you see, their eyes are off the preacher, and their eyes are upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And all, uh, and all the preachers become so small and so, so insignificant because Jesus Christ is so big. They've got a big Savior they never had before. And they're bathed in Calvary's love. They're gently taken by the Holy Ghost. I say that very, very reverently. They're gently taken by the Holy Ghost. Because in revival, there's mighty tornadoes, I know that, but the greatest thing about revival is the gentleness of God. And the Holy Ghost gently bathes you in Calvary's love. And you weep quietly over and over and over, and you say, Oh, is this my God? Is this my Savior? Is this what Jesus Christ suffered for me? Is this how much God so loved me as to give his only begotten son? And all you can do is weep and weep and say, Hallelujah. Oh, Christ, I thank you for saving my soul. Oh, Lord Jesus, thou art so glorious and so wonderful. And you have a vision of the cross. Now, you say, what has this got to do about revival? A lot, my brother. A lot, my sister. For example, Jeremiah 33 and 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. And I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knewest not. Now... Uh, in the, as you know, the Hebrew word here is the hidden concealed thing. In the deeper inner recesses. And God is saying, if you call unto me, I will answer thee and I will show thee, reveal to thee my treasures. Hidden concealed things that you have never seen in your life before. In other words, God says, I'm going to open you the windows of heaven. And in Malachi 3.10, prove me now here with me of the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the window of heaven. And pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Windows in heaven. And God says, prove me right now. I won't fail you. you. If you don't fail me, I won't fail you. God never failed a brother. God never failed a sister. God never failed a child of his. It was sincere and real and willing to pay the price. God says, prove me now, right now. And I'll open you the windows of heaven. And I'll pour you out such a blessing that you shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, friend, that's what you have never seen in your church. That's what you have never seen in America, where there's been so much blessing that you had to say, Oh, God, I can't stand anymore. And you didn't know what to do with all the young converts. Uh, I always get a surprise when some evangelist tells me that there was 500 souls saved in a great campaign, and then they don't build another uh, a church building. Where do these 500 souls go? If the church is already packed, where do the other 500 souls go? I can never understand that. pastor told me that during his lifetime he had taken in something like 5,000 new members. Well, I said, did you build another church feeding 5,000 people? But no, still the same size of the church, and it's always been full. Something wrong about this business. Now, friend, God says, I'll, I'll pour you out a blessing. There will not be room enough to receive it. And you'll extend right out, and you'll, you'll say, oh God, say thy hand, I can't contain any more. And we have seen often in Eastern Europe, we had to stop evangelizing. You know why? We didn't know what to do with the young converts. With so many thousands professing faith in Christ. Because we didn't know what to do with them all. And I had to ask holy men of God, like Dr. Ari Neighbor. He's one of the most famous Southern Baptist preachers, preaching uh, with many of the giants of Southern Baptist Convention. Very blessed man, but most of his ministry later was an independent Bible teaching work with Campbell Morgan. I invited him to help me to take care of the converts and hungry, the Bible teach them. We had to stop again and again and, and establish these converts in the faith and then begin evangelizing all over again and stop again for another month. Take care of Bible studies for indoctrinate these young converts and then start all over again evangelizing. And you see, we have the other promise. We mentioned the challenge again in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will heal the land. Now, when God says I will hear from heaven, he means I'll open the windows of heaven and I'll answer prayer. Now, when you come into the Acts of the Apostles, you find about the open windows everywhere. 
Pentecost was the day of the open heaven. You read in Acts 2, 33, Peter's explanation of the phenomenon of Pentecost. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, he has sent forth this, which you now see and hear, the promised Holy Spirit. And when the heavens are open to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost come down to the waiting charge. And then we find the heavens are open again in Acts 4, 31. And when they prayed, the place was shaken, we were all assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, have you ever been in a prayer meeting like that? Tell the truth. Have you ever been in a prayer meeting like that? The heavens were once again open. And you remember, the heavens were open again from Stephen, as he was being, oh, being martyred for Christ's sake. And he says, I see the heaven open, and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Glory to God. And then I find the heavens open again because of Stephen's death. You find that the heavens are open again. And there you find a voice from heaven saying to Saul of Tarsus, the greatest enemy of the church, Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? The heavens are open for the salvation of the biggest sinner of the Lord. And I could go on and on telling you about these open windows. Now let me just give you one or two of our revival experiences that will whet your appetite. So many believers have an idea that this revival business is something that we don't understand. I've had very, very precious men of God say to me, we believe that revivals happen periodically under the sovereignty of God. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I'm a Scotsman, brought up a Calvinist of the Calvinist. I'm a, 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 I believe in the sovereignty of God. But friend, I don't believe, friend, that, that God sends occasional revivals as it pleases him. You see, I believe revival, friend, is an abnormal situation. You see, you are living a normal Christian life. You are an abnormal pastor. You are an abnormal evangelist. You are an abnormal Christian. And the church that you're connected with is living a normal Christian life. It's not God's norm. And so we must have revival to bring us up into God's norm. As I say to you, I've been in Hungary for years and never had a Christian free of God's and revival. Why? God sent revival. And now, you see, we didn't need the revival anymore. We need fresh anointings of the Holy Ghost, yes. Uh, but we were so uh, elevated to the high positions in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just give you some of these illustrations, uh, what I mean about revival. And what God has given us, because so many believers say, well, we don't know if we can have revival, yes or no. We don't know if God wants to send revival. That, that, that's nonsense. My brother, God wants to send revival. Look at the Christians we know. Is that God's New Testament standard for Christianity for them? No. Is God pleased with them? No. Is God pleased with my ministry? No. Is God pleased with your church? No. Then it's abnormal. And so revival, friends, is when God brings the church to the normal condition. And so, uh, as I said the other morning, supposing you said to me, hey, Brother Stuart, how is your, your little daughter Sherry? Oh, well, I said, hey, she's quite all right just now, but next month she'll be down now with a little while, and then uh, she'll be down again for June and uh, September again. And, well, what father would be satisfied with such a health for his child? And we have got Christian people and they're living up and down, up and down, up and down. I never knew so many backsliders in America right now. I never knew. I had the, the privilege of leading one of the, the, the most famous of American evangelists of the Lord. And that man pre preached to thousands, night after night, 10,000. He won thousands of Christ. And he became a backslider. From the, the leaders of Youth for Christ, the of Youth for Christ, preaching to thousands night after night, denies the blood, ridicules the gospel, and is an NC coast to coast in the Canadian broadcasting system, working with film stars and such like today. And I could tell you people who, have, who no longer have an open window, and the backsliding is everywhere. You did run well, but who did hinder you from obeying the truth? Yes. And is God satisfied with these conditions? Absolutely not. Amen. And that's why I believe God wants to send revival. 
And I know when I go on my knees and I know there's no sin in my heart in life, I know God will lie. And I, I said to, I think, Brother Robertson last night, how would you like to be in a church where nobody resisted the Holy Ghost? I was meet in the church recently in Northern Ireland, and hundreds were coming away. Didn't know one believer, old or young, who resisted the Holy Ghost. Everyone moved on with God. The revival come that way. Now let me give you, I believe, friends, that God will send you revival, and God's willing to have revival. He wants us to cooperate with him, and then the heavens are open. Let me give you a little experience about this open window. I remember some years ago uh, when God gave us so many thousands of souls in Hungary, I had to go around different churches to have Bible study. Now, when you get young souls say, don't have singspiration. They're all right, but that's not enough. That's only, that's only fooling around. I believe in singing and all that way, but uh, what the, the believers need is indoctrinated in the Word of God. You say, and that's what we do. We get out the Bible and we have meetings. And to scare the daylights out of carnal Christians, we say we're going to speak on the five little bit little bit of offerings. See? And they'll never come back if they're not spiritual. So we clear the dead wood out of the place. And we don't have anything, just the teaching of the word. We say now we're singing a hymn, we're going to pray and then we're going to expound the word. And we may go verse by verse through Romans. Justification and sanctification. The work of the Lord Jesus for us and then the work of the Holy Ghost in us, you see. And I remember one night, you could only get into this meeting by admission of a ticket, where you had professed faith recently in Jesus Christ, only for young converts. There are not many there, maybe 1,500 or so, but this night we were expounding Ephesians. And my interpreter whispered to me, he said, hey, James, he said, please stop, please stop. I said, uh, what's the matter? Hey, don't you feel well? He said, this is a new test. I'm going. I said, where? He said, up of course. I said, but I said, don't go up now. I said, I'm not even finished. I said, I haven't even started. I said, we've, we've only been teaching an hour. I said, I don't text anymore. I said, well, go on. God will give you grace. But then, lo and behold, I began to go up too. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't very soon until I was up and gone. And my saddle was gone. And I come down. I don't know how long I was up there. So long he was up there. But when we come down, to my astonishment, there were all these people there. I didn't know were there. And all I could see them was, uh, you see, you see, well, didn't they run around the tabernacle? There was no room to run around the church. It was a Lutheran church. And all I could hear was, see the tears rolling down the tree. And all they were saying is, I love the Lord Jesus. And you see, you know what happened? Every one of us had gone out. Every one of us had gone out. We weren't there anymore. We weren't good at this anymore. That's what I'm talking about. Now I can remember in the city of Trondheim, in the largest cathedral of Scandinavia, sitting maybe 5,000 people. One of the most brilliant, most beautiful cathedrals in all Europe. It was built for the Roman Catholics before the Reformation. And God is giving us mighty revivals in Trondheim. With over four meetings of 10,000 people in the open air. But I can remember this night I was preaching on justification and giving a Bible, a Bible exposition on justification, a gospel message actually to sinners that may be Lutherans depending on the ritualism, the church membership for salvation. So we give a verse by verse exposition of Romans, justification by faith through Christ alone. And just as I was coming about the end of my message, the power of God came upon me and my whole body shook back and forth. And I said, oh God, please take your hand. Oh God, I've got to finish this down in some way. I've got to finish it some way. And then, to my astonishment, I looked and my interpreter couldn't speak anymore. And he, a big fellow, seven feet, he was moved by the Holy Ghost back and forward. And then we stopped. And I said, let us bow our head in prayer. And there was such a silence. Now you listening? There was such a silence. And that if I hadn't broken the silence and pronounced the benediction all these thousands of people would have shrieked out aloud yes. so great was the presence of God and do you know that when I went into the vestry where there were maybe 40 other preachers 
Muslims of all denominations, born again men, because I never worked with Muslims. I would never have a Muslim in my platform or let him pray with me or work with him. He may be my next door neighbor, but he's not my brother in Christ. If he denies the virgin birth of Christ, the verbal inspiration of script is no brother to me. I'll only have a citywide campaign with fundamentalists. That's all, never modern. And if you preach the full gospel, the moderns will hate you. They won't love you. But they were 40 born again men of all groups. And you know, friend, we didn't speak to each other. The bishop didn't see, uh, didn't see anything. We were all gay. And to my astonishment, friend, there were cars parked outside the cathedral. Nobody drove the car. Everybody walked home. And later, maybe two or three o'clock in the morning, they came to take the cars away. Now, who told them? No one. And I couldn't even say hello to my interpreter four o'clock in the morning. Nobody could speak to each other. And to see these thousands of people leave that cathedral and not saying yes or no. Yes, over the top. And yes, I come to America and I see after a, after a Bible, I'm coming to preach and maybe a, a, a church here in the Southland and, and here I see parading all in the front of the church after the Sunday school, men smoking. And then you, 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 you listen and they say, they're talking about the crowd. And then some young fellows are talking about the football game. And I have to go in and minister the word of God in that atmosphere. And sometimes the church service is like, at the beginning, is like a menagerie feeding time. There, there's no reverence. So, and, and, and how can the Holy Ghost work if there's no reverence? And you see what happens on Sunday morning before the preacher preaches, uh, uh, when they just talk, 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 talk about anything. Now, it's nice to have a, a, a friendly church. It's nice to talk about the weather and everything else and how's Mary and how's John. That's part of our church fellowship. But, oh, my brother, my sister, our first business is to meet under an open heaven. That's our first business. And I could go on and on this morning giving you a incident after incident of the, of the power of God coming upon a meeting. I can remember in the city of Latvia, you'll see the, the actual church where I was associate pastor and evangelist for a year in Russia, in the city of Riga. Now we had over 2,000 seats in the building. And I can remember the Lord was giving us revival, meetings going on day and night. There were just as many at 3 o'clock in the morning as 3 o'clock in the afternoon. God was saving hundreds of souls. But God said to me, this is not Pentecost. This is not all that I can do. And God challenged me to believe him. And I, back and forward, pastor in prayer for two weeks, in the woods, beautiful Russian woods, wonderful place alone with God. And then, uh, when it came this first Sunday morning, we started in there at 11 o'clock, and the meeting was still going on at 11 o'clock at night. And my dear friend, when the, all over the audience, people were crying aloud for salvation, there must have been about 200 people cried aloud for salvation, got an invitation. That couldn't stand the presence of God. Now remember just after the war in, in Norway, I was in a certain city, and we'd have about 4,000 people in this theater because we have about six or seven meetings every day when revival comes, to say. Old John Wesley, he carried on. It was quite easy for him. He was working in revival. It's when you have no revival, you all, you all get physically tired. When the Holy Ghost works, you think nobody's tired. Amen. Nobody's tired. And so here in Norway, about maybe, we're just after, just before lunch on a Sunday. We're in this beautiful theater. And suddenly, the meeting is over. And the union men are push, pulling along the, the curtain in the theater. And suddenly, both of them, a young man and elder man, drop down like dead men on the floor. And I, I ran, we ran to them. And we called the doctor. They weren't dead. What happened was, they were smitten by the Holy Ghost in conviction of sin. Now, friend, that's what we need today. That is revival. Now, how can we have revival? It's when we allow the Holy Ghost to have his full way. 
Now, the three things a believer can do. He can resist the Holy Spirit, he can grieve the Holy Spirit, and he can quench the Holy Spirit. And I can say he can do another thing, four things. He can lie to the Holy Ghost. Now, as long as as Christians, lying to the Holy Ghost, resisting the Holy Ghost, grieving the Holy Ghost, quenching the Holy Ghost, we're not going to have revival. And you know, many people say, oh yes, we blame the evangelists. And say, the reason why we didn't have revival is because we had the wrong evangelists. That's a lie, that's not true. You had the right evangelists, but you had the wrong approach. They were still in the camp, because God cannot fail. God cannot deny his word. And that's an impossibility for God to deny his word. And if God the Holy Ghost doesn't move in, it's because of sin in the camp. Now, you can grieve the Holy Spirit, as you know in Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, the Holy Spirit, is, the Spirit, the symbol of the Holy Spirit is of the dove, and the dove is so easily frightened away. Brother so sister, you can only grieve a person that loves you. The person I've grieved the most in my life is my wife. Why? Because nobody loves me apart from my mother, like my wife. And the, you, you can only grieve a person who loves you and who knows you in a deep, deep, intimate way. I know how many times we grieve the Holy Spirit of God by bitterness and by jealousies and backbiting. And then the Word of God says, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. Now you can see the context of the passage. You can put the fire of God out in your own soul. You can put the fire of God out, fire of God out in another brother's soul. I put the fire of God out in my soul the other day in England. It was a... Uh, I went to a home where I was having hospitality. And uh, I had to wait a few hours and uh, the, the television was on. And I watched the wrong program. And uh, I had a cloud between me and my Lord for one solid week after that. Now, how did I let the devil get me into such a situation? Hey? And I'm 42 years on the road, starting January. Hey? And how will I know, man, like me, how did I get the devil, let me get in that trap? But there, there, there's just one or two things there, and my vision was marred. Took me a whole week to come back into true communion with God. You can, you can put the fire of God out in your own life, and you can put the fire of God out in the life of others. And then, friend, you can resist the Holy Ghost. I used to preach to the young, a young preacher, only unconverted people could resist the Holy Ghost, but I was stupid. I know the reference is to Stephen saying, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as you, you, you uncircumcised in heart and in ears. But I was no longer, no sooner evangelizing, I discovered you couldn't have revival because belief was resisting the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you knew as you went on deeper and deeper, and God was speaking through you, you were talking a stone wall. The backs were up, and the rejects of the message of God, the Holy Ghost. And I believe you can write Ichabod over many churches, and no matter how many pastors they have, that, that church could never have revival. They have sinned away. They have sinned against the Holy Ghost. Now believers are resisting the Holy Ghost. Every time a brother gives a message in the meeting, if it's a real message from God, there's resistance. Now many believers are saying, Lord, I'll follow thee, but let me first. Me first, Lord. I don't care, Lord, with... I, it's all right, Lord, you can be second, but Lord, my darling self, I have to come first. Lord, me first. And some of the biggest lies are told in our country. Some of the biggest lies are told in the country. And believers say, I've surrendered all, and Lord, I, I, I love you, now follow me 100%, and they don't. And they're resisting the fullness of the Holy Ghost, resisting the Holy Ghost working in the meeting. And yet they profess to be born again. You can also tell a lie to the Holy Ghost. I believe Ananias the fire would believe it. I believe that. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. God came in judgment. I believe they went to heaven, but they were judged before their time. Now, a believer can allow Satan to fill his heart. Ananias the fire is it. And a lie to the Holy Ghost. And I believe that that's one of the greatest sins a believer can commit today. They are lying to the Holy Ghost. The lie to the Holy Ghost, because the life we are living is a sham. It's a sham. It's, a, it's not the true life, what we are in the dark. And the preach a sham, and the live a sham, and the sing a sham. And, the, and they're really lying to the Holy Ghost. Now, you know how I know? 
There's millions, brother, sister, never have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the work of God is held up for lack of money. And you cannot tell me, friends, that the Holy Ghost is not challenging many believers and saying, surrender all. I want you to give me that money. And you say, I, I surrender all. But you told a lie to the Holy Ghost because that money is there and you're never giving it to God. But when you do not grieve the Holy Spirit, when you do not quench the Holy Spirit, when you do not resist the Holy Spirit, when you do not lie to the Holy Ghost, then you are filled with the Spirit. Amen. Speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5.19. Oh brother, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you want to revive? If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture says, from his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. One brother can bring the revival to the church. One sister can bring the revival to the church. Now, this is what I can't understand about your camp meeting. I don't know about this camp meeting. Why is it when God breaks through in these meetings, why is it that you can't bring the fire and power of God back into your own church? And why can there not be a revolution in the, your church? That they're never the same again. I have letters from churches in Eastern Europe. And they have never been the same. The right means said it was 25 years ago and the revival broke out in our church. We've never been the same since that day. Never been the same since that day. Now friend, we don't want something passing excitement, just a passing emotion for you days. We want something to last for all eternity because the time is so short. And God is saying, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, hands up those of you who believe that God wants to send revival. Let me see. Hey, praise God. Now, are you willing to say, Lord, I'm a candidate for revival. Lord, I'm a candidate for revival. Now, God's going to lead you, friend, in the dark water. God's going to lead you in the dark water. One of my revival verses is, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, glory to God, joy cometh in the morning. And then you have to battle against the forces of hell. You have to pray through. And allow the Holy Ghost to pray through you, as our young brother was mentioned the other morning, with groanings which cannot be uttered. God praying with God. Groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, friend, if my people will seek my face, then when we begin to seek the face of the Lord and wait upon him, he's going to show us the things which are wrong in your life. Now, honestly, before God this morning, you may think that you're absolutely clean. The slate is clean. There's nothing between you and the Lord. But will you not give God the benefit of the doubt? Will you not go away, go, go away with God today and say, Oh God, I can be deceived myself, perhaps so deceitful. Oh, God, oh blessed God, will you turn the set of thy word upon me? Oh God, if there, will you show me if there's anything wrong in my life, anything hindering the blessing of God in my life? Maybe it's an apology. Maybe it's your bad sense. Maybe you have to apologize to your wife. I spend more time apologizing to my family than anywhere else. Yeah, but, if, if, but, but if you ask my family who, who's, the, who, who's the greatest preacher in the world, they'll tell you something. Yeah. I wouldn't dare stand before you preaching if I didn't live the life in my own family. All my family oh, is serving the Lord. Yeah. My, my, my boy is 22 years of age. He's an evangelist. My daughter and her husband are evangelists. Yeah. My, my little girl, whom we only have seen half a year out of 15 years, is a missionary's child. She, she could bring revival here this, maybe this morning, just by giving her testimony. She'll be 15 in January. She's gone the way of the cross. But friend, the hardest place to live for Christ in your own home, the devil see to that all right. Yeah. Maybe you have to make an apology to your pastor. Maybe you have to make an apology to some of the, the, these, the, the deacons. There's been trouble in the church and you didn't deal with the thing in a Christ-like way. But I believe that one reason why we don't see revival is because we don't give God time to work. Everybody's in a hurry. But oh friend, to be able to say, oh God, we're, we're flat in our face before thee. And oh God, we will not give you rest until you open the windows of heaven and you pour us out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Oh God, I'm a candidate for revival. No matter what it costs, oh God, use me. You needn't be too old. I've known retired men and women have the greatest minister of life after those seven years of age. You can't be too young. I've known a lot of youth children. In the, in the revival of Mary McChain and Dundee, there were hundreds of children in revival meetings. Can you imagine? How the revival meetings are on? Hundreds of them. 
not only 10 years of age, hundreds of them. Prayer meetings, testimony meetings, you're not too old and not too young. When is your, is your bucket empty? You're ready for God this morning? Let's pray that God will move in.